welcome everyone. It's great to have you with us today for another session. And today we have a case discussion series and it's great to have you here. Now, yes, coming to uh, the overall picture, I'm Dr. Mandana Donahue from Oral Pathology 360. And it's Oral Pathology 360 is all about bringing together everyone and everything that matters and relates to the diagnosis of oral diseases. Coming to the case discussion, this is not the first one on the series. We have a whole lot of them on the channel. You can find these are a few of the people who have had case discussions. And you can find all the details if you either go to that tiny URL or basically go to the channel and click on our playlist. You will find it there. Lots of interesting stuff there. And I hope you will visit and you will watch. And as always, what we do is really dependent a lot on your support. And uh, it, it, your support can be either in the form of contributions, uh, financial contributions that will help us go on and fund everything. Or it could be just by you know hitting a like, a subscribe, a share, a comment, basically keeping the content uh, you know, well interactive and well uh, liked and followed on various social media that gives us a higher ranking that gives oral pathology discussions a higher ranking and it's always of course nice to have that and for today we have dr sona s shah with us she is from the dental medicine uh, school of dental medicine university of nevada las vegas now she is one of those people i have been very fortunate to find Thanks to LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn has made a great contribution <laughs> to our events. And it's it's great to have seen her, to have met her. And uh, there's a lot that she does. Anyone who is on LinkedIn and within you know, the community realizes that she does a lot. She's involved a lot. And her lectures are very well liked and very well attended. She has a number of lectures. She is not only academically involved, but she is also involved in clinical practice, she, a combination of oral pathology and oral medicine. Now, with that very short introduction, I shall, uh, yes. Hi, Sonal, welcome. Hi, Mandana. Uh, so nice of you to invite me here today. You're most welcome, yes. You are absolutely clear. So we have the... Uh, sound and I think we'll just start with your lecture. So um, uh, let's go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning to my India colleagues. Um, it's uh, evening here for me uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada, in the US. Um, and then good afternoon to anyone else that's listening anywhere else in the world. Um, so I am bringing you some interesting, a captivating collection of clinical oral pathology cases uh, today. So let me begin. So I have six cases for you today. Um, the first two cases will be oral manifestations of systemic diseases. The second two will be diagnosis and management of rare mucosal autoimmune diseases. And then the last two will be very, um, very rare uh, malignancies of the oral cavity. So as uh, Dr. Mandana Dani, who mentioned, um, I am a board certified oral pathologist, but I practice a lot of oral medicine and diagnose and treat patients here. Okay, so let me get started. My first case is a 64 year old male patient that was referred for swelling of the lower lip and intraoral ulcers. Um, for as far as medical history, the patient had hypertension and was taking a medication, high cholesterol on medication. Um, also, the patient had rheumatoid arthritis and started taking Humira, um, which is also known as Adaluma, Adalumumab. He was PPD positive in the past, and he had a nine-month uh, treatment of um, a prophylactic treatment of isoniazid and vitamin B6. As far as social history, he uh, was a past cigarette smoker. He quit in 1990. Um, there were, in terms of history of present illness, the lesions started a month ago and were progressively worsening. And there are no significant extra oral findings at this time. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you a number of, of clinical pictures. So this is the patient um, extra orally. So you can appreciate that there is some asymmetrical lip enlargement here. 
Okay, this is sort of um, reflecting uh, the lower lip and the labial mucosa. Again, you can appreciate there's a swelling and an enlargement. You also start to see um, some hyperplastic tissue, ulceration, rolled borders, and something, some uh, deposits here that look like pseudomembranous candidiasis. This is another intraoral uh, photo. And here you can really appreciate in the anterior mandibular vestibule, there is an, a, a kind of a linear ulceration with a uh, rolled hyperplastic margins. And this is a nice, uh, another nice high power view of this, uh, of this lesion. And here you can again see these, uh, what, what looks like pseudomembranous candidiasis uh, and uh, ulceration. Okay, so in terms of clinical and differential diagnosis and next step, when I first saw this patient, the first thing that comes to mind is a malignancy. And of course, squamous cell carcinoma is the most common oral malignancy. So that was the first thing that, that came to my mind. Um, I also kind of entertained the thought of, of maybe a deep fungal infection or something along those lines. Uh, so those were kind of where, where the, the thoughts went. And of course, the next step was to do um, an incisional biopsy, which I did. So now for those, uh, you know, my pathology colleagues out there, I have some photo mics. This is a low power photo mic of the incisional biopsy. And here you can see at this power that there's uh, several granulomas here, a collection of granulomas. And you start to see in one of the, the granulomas that I'm pointing to that there could be necrosis in the middle of this granuloma. This is a higher power photo mic in, in the, one of the granulomas. And you can appreciate here some multinucleated giant cells, okay, along with um, macrophages and um, uh, lymphocytes. This is a high power photo mic inside another one of the granulomas. And again, you can see the um, multinucleated giant cells and you can appreciate the necrosis here. So, in terms of uh, the diagnosis, when we saw these necrotizing granulomas, of course, I started thinking about tuberculosis. Um, and so we did order an AFB, acid fast bacilli, and that did identify tubercle bacilli. So therefore, we were able to make a diagnosis of chronic granulomatous inflammatory reaction consistent with oral manifestations of tuberculosis. Okay, the patient also had um, some candidiasis uh, superimposed or, or nearby. So in terms of treatment, um, you know, we prescribed an antifungal to deal with the candidiasis. Um, of course, that was the minor concern. The more major concern was the, uh, the tuberculosis oral manifestation. So we referred the patient to an infectious disease doctor uh, and the patient received combination therapy of isoniazid, rifampin, ethambutol, and pyrazinamide for six months. Okay, so here's some before and afters. This is extra orally, before treatment and after treatment. You can see the difference in the size of the uh, size and swelling of the lower lip. And here's intraorally, a before and after. Um, again, you can see how um, these, this lesion resolved after treatment for the uh, oral manifestation of tuberculosis. So now the question in this case is, you know, what happened with this patient? Why did he get, uh, you know, uh, get TB? And so it turns out that um, the medication that he was prescribed, Humira, for um, his rheumatoid arthritis definitely uh, puts the patient at risk for developing tuberculosis and other serious infections. So as you can see here, why did this patient develop TB? Serious infections have happened in people taking Humira. These infections include tuberculosis. That is one of the, the top um, findings um, in terms of infectious diseases in patients that take Humira. Um, and also other infections caused by viruses, fungi, bacteria that have spread throughout the body. So there is um, warnings now that any time a patient is put on Humira, the doctor should test for TB before starting that and monitor during um, uh, Humira treatment. So we found this to be a very interesting case. 
Okay, so I will move on to my next case. So this is another um, oral manifestation of systemic disease. And this sort of ties into the first case, and you'll see how in a moment. Um, the, in this case, the patient was a 28-year-old white female that was referred to the, or the oral medicine clinic for multiple ulcers and enlarged lip. So that sounds kind of familiar to the last case, ulcers and enlarged lip. The patient denies any medical history, but then upon um, you know, uh, questioning, finally reported having severe GI issues. On extraoral examination, the lower lip was enlarged. On intraoral examination, we could see multiple linear ulcers in the vestibules, and there were hyperplastic cobblestone bilateral buccal mucosa. The patient denies oral pain and refused the offer of topical steroids for the oral ulcers. And now I will show you the clinical pictures. So here we are. Um, this is the extra oral uh, kind of uh, lip image, and she does have a, a enlarged lower lip. It may be a little bit harder to tell here if you haven't seen this patient before uh, to be able to compare to what her normal lip side size is. And it also looks like maybe she's got some angular chylitis going on here. This picture makes it more apparent, the swelling of her lower lip, okay? And it was kind of a firm swelling when, when it was palpated. All right, so now for intraorally, here we are in the right mandibular vestibule. You can appreciate kind of a linear ulcer with these rolled elevated hyperplastic margins. This is on the other side, the left mandibular vestibule, a similar finding here. And then we had another lesion on the right uh, maxillary vestibule. And here you can also appreciate some ulceration. So with all of those findings, we really suspected Crohn's disease. Okay, so um, with these, there was a little bit of cobblestoning, the firm enlargement of the lip, um, and these linear ulcers in the vestibule. And then, we, as I mentioned, we questioned her further and found that she was having some severe GI issues. So we highly suspected Crohn's disease. Um, we referred the patient for colonoscopy, GI evaluation, and uh, but unfortunately, the patient was lost to follow-up before we got a definitive uh, diagnosis. Okay, so, um, but management of her likely Crohn's will lead to improvement and resolution of oral findings. Um, patients that uh, have a similar clinical presentation in Crohn's are often treated with sulfa drugs, metronidazole, or more recently tying this into the last case, Humira treatment. Uh, patients are recommended a special carbohydrate diet as well. So these are ways of managing this. And of course, if we manage the underlying systemic diseases, it makes a big difference um, in uh, the oral manifestations. Okay, so that was two cases uh, exhibiting oral manifestations of systemic diseases. Now I will move on to the diagnosis and management of complex rare autoimmune mucosal diseases. Okay, so in this case, there was a middle-aged male patient that presents with mouth ulcers that come and go for many years, but are significantly getting worse. Medical history, the patient denies he's not on any medications, he doesn't smoke or drink. On extra oral exam, there were no significant findings. There were a uh, patient denied any skin lesions, any um, eye lesions or eye mucosal involvement. Um, and then on intraoral exam, there was erythematous bleeding gingiva, sort of a disquamative gingivitis clinical presentation. And there was also a large blister on the palate. So the clinical diagnosis was a vesiculobullous disease, such as pemphigus or pemphigoid. Um, and as far as the initial treatment plan, I decided to proceed with an incisional biopsy for routine h &E microscopy, and then also immunofluorescence, which is considered the gold standards for diagnosis of pemphigus and pemphigoid. Okay, so here's some clinical pictures. Here you can appreciate the kind of uh, erythematous bleeding gingiva, the disquamative gingivitis appearance here. Okay, and this is a picture of the ruptured uh, bulla. We didn't get it when it, when it was intact, but um, here you can see that there was uh, a ruptured lesion on the palate. 
So these are some uh, biopsy microscopic images. This is at um, sort of a low to medium power 10x magnification. And you can see here that the entire epithelium is separated from the underlying connective tissue. And you can see that there is um, you know, diffuse chronic inflammatory cells throughout the uh, connective tissue. Here is a kind of a, a little bit higher power image. And this is showing you the clean separation of the full thickness of the epithelium from the underlying connective tissue. So of course, these findings are consistent with the diagnosis of benign mucous membrane pemphigoid. This was the immunofluorescence. This, uh, this is a representative image. I don't have the actual image, um, but it, it was very similar to this. And so you can see that there's, um, you know, the green fluorescent line is right between the epithelium and connective tissue um, in the basement membrane zone. So again, um, this was a uh, diagnostic of a uh, pemphigoid. So, in terms of the diagnosis and treatment plan, um, the definitive diagnosis was mucous membrane pemphigoid, but there was an additional interesting finding in this case. Um, it was found uh, during the examination of the, um, the immunofluorescence uh, that the pattern corresponded to mucous membrane pemphigoid along with an association with another autoimmune disease. So we all know that autoimmune diseases can run um, you know, in pairs or multiple. Um, so now we need to work up the patient and find out what other autoimmune disease that patient may have. So I treated this patient with a topical steroid dexamethasone rinse, QID. Um, I also ordered blood test for Dapsone. Dapsone is a steroid sparing um, drug that works well for pemphigoid. Um, but you need to make sure the patient can metabolize it. So I ordered G6PD um, a blood test. I also ordered blood work to look for other autoimmune diseases, ANA, SNA, Smith, Rowe, and La. Um, the blood results did come back positive for another autoimmune disease. And so I referred the patient to a rheumatologist for full workup and um, regular follow-up in the oral medicine clinic. And I also referred the patient for regular eye examinations. As you all know, pemphigoid likes the uh, mucous membrane pemphigoid likes the oral mucosa, but it also can affect eye mucosa and lead to, um, you know, to scarring and, and uh, simblepharon and things like that. So I definitely um, I want to keep track of the patient's um, eye mucosa. And then of course, I always ask about skin lesions every time I see the patient. Okay, let me move on to the next case, uh, case four. This was a male patient that presented as an emergency visit with mouth and lip ulcers, bleeding and pain. Um, the history of present illness, sudden onset, he did report trying a new drug from his country, and then he reported having this outbreak. His medical history, he denies he's a non-smoker on extra oral exam. On extra oral exam, there was um, ulcerated and erythematous lips, no other skin lesions at this time. Intraoral exam, generalized ulcers and erythema throughout the oral cavity. So the initial clinical diagnosis was, I thought of erythema multiform first, and I'm gonna show you why. When you look at his lips, it had this bloody crusted appearance. And he did say that there was an association with a new medication that he had just tried. So that's the reason that that was the initial clinical diagnosis. So then I put the patient on a seven day course of 40 milligrams of daily prednisone, viscous lidocaine, and one week follow up. And that is a good regimen for erythema multiform, the 40 milligrams of prednisone daily. At this time, the patient could not even open his mouth for pictures. Um, and also another factor was he only spoke Spanish. So communication was very, very difficult with this patient. Okay, so I, I told you I wasn't able to get clinical pictures at that appointment, but when he came for follow-up, he had minimal intraoral improvement. Um, so we decided to biopsy to rule out any mucous membrane disease. I did an incisional biopsy for H&E and immunofluorescence, and I asked him to continue his daily prednisone regimen, and then I took clinical pics. So these are the clinical pictures. Um, here you can see, remember, this is after one week of 40 milligrams of prednisone. So it was actually worse than this. So here you can appreciate the way the lip looks erythematous and ulcerated extraorally. 
These are some intraoral photos of the tongue. You can see the ventral tongue and the dorsal tongue with erythema and ulceration. These were the buccal mucosa pictures. Again, you can see erythema and ulceration. I apologize, these were a little blurry. The patient had a difficult time opening and staying still enough, long enough for me to take, some, take these pictures. Okay, so here's what the biopsy showed. You can see that the epithelium has come off the connective tissue. You can also see that um, there are some degenerating zinc cells here. This higher power image shows acantholysis of the epithelial cells and degenerating zinc cells. So all of those things are consistent with the diagnosis of pemphigus vulgaris. Uh, we also sent for immunofluorescence and um, it, there was a chicken wire pattern like this and that was diagnostic of pemphigus vulgaris. So in terms of treatment, um, I raised his dose of prednisone to 80 milligrams from 40 to 80. Um, I asked the patient to monitor his blood pressure and take vitamin D and calcium supplements because high doses of systemic steroids are, um, can lead to osteoporosis. Um, and then I also asked for a one-week follow-up. So the patient comes back a week later. His mouth lesions are better, but there are widespread skin lesions and blisters now. So that was a surprising finding. I think the steroid treatment kind of stirred something up and led to these skin lesions. So now the patient has these extra oral lesions that he did not have before. So these are some skin lesions. There, there were small vesicles and bulla. These are some lesions on the back. You can see that there's a ruptured um, uh, blister here. These are lesions on the temple. And again, you can appreciate a ruptured lesion. So um, it turns out now that the patient has pemphigus vulgaris with um, extra oral findings. So this is beyond my scope of practice. So I referred the patient. This was a case from, when, from my time at NYU. So fortunately, there was a uh, pemphigus expert named Dr. Miriam Pomeranz at the NYU Dermatology Clinic. So I, I referred the patient there. She changed the medicine from 80 milligrams of prednisone to methylprednisolone which is stronger than prednisone and better absorbed. Um, and the patient was being evaluated for rituximab treatment. As you know, these monoclonal antibodies are being used more and more for autoimmune diseases. And rituximab shows good effectiveness in cases of pemphigus vulgaris. Also, regular follow-up of the patient in the oral medicine clinic and regular collaboration with Dr. Pomeranz. So this was an interesting case because you saw that um, it was, you know, the patient had intraoral and then upon treatment, they developed extraoral pemphigus lesions. Okay, so I appreciate you staying with me. I apologize for the interruptions. I'm, I want to go through these two cases. I'll put a pep in my step. So these last two cases are atypical malignancies of the oral cavity. So we're all used to seeing squamous cell carcinomas, but we get excited when we see something else. Okay, so this was what you could call my case of a lifetime. So this was a 49-year-old Hispanic male. He was referred for painful enlarging uh, growth on the maxillary gingiva that arose immediately after SRP treatment. So here's a clinical photo. You can see this dark pigmentation along the palate and uh, palatal gingiva, and then there's this um, pigmented mass here. This is another uh, nice clinical image. Here you can appreciate the pigmentation of the maxillary uh, buccal gingiva. Okay, and this was thought to be racial pigmentation all these years because the patient was Hispanic and this was slowly spreading and um, diffusing. And this is a palatal view. So I think we all know diagnosis management. Okay, so this was definitely a case of, um, I suspected melanoma, oral mel mucosal melanoma right away. I did a biopsy, and here you can see the, um, a nested organoid pattern, and this is a higher power view showing you the pleomorphic cells. Um, and then you can also appreciate in some of the cells, there are intracellular melanin pigment granules. Of course, we did in, uh, immunohistochemistry as well. S100 was positive, HMB45, and uh, melan A, uh, and some other uh, stains that uh, definitely pointed towards this being a case of melanoma. So in terms of treatment and follow-up, um, there was imaging and the patient had three positive neck lymph nodes. The standard treatment for oral melanomas for this case was a complete maxillectomy and a radical neck dissection. That's what was recommended. 
Now, that's really going to affect the quality of life in this relatively young 49-year-old patient. So um, I had a contact, um, a melanoma oncology uh, expert um, at when, I, when I was at NYU. And so we decided to try that protocol of immunotherapy on this patient with oral mucosal melanoma. So this patient had um, immunotherapy every three weeks for nine months. Um, they had ipilimumab and pembrolizumab and responded very, very well. This was a great su success story. Pigmentation decreased, the tumor responded well, the nodes necrosed, and the patient has had no surgery to date. The patient is doing well. Look at this, I have to show you. I did a special effect just for this. This is the pre and post treatment. So you can appreciate here the um, gingival pigmentation in this mass, and this was um, after, uh, you know, the the nine months of immunotherapy. So my colleagues and I, we wrote a paper on this if you want to um, read more about this. This is from, um, this is the reference here. Okay, I wanna finish the last case. Thank you again for staying with me. So that was my case of a lifetime oral mucosal melanoma. And I, that case is really dear to me because of how we tried a new type of treatment that really spared his quality of life. All right, moving on to case six. This was a more recent case that I had here when um, in uh, at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. There was a 65-year-old male that presented with bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy. He also has concern for a floor of mouth mass. His medical history, he has hypertension. He had a lymphoma treated in 2018, and he had prostate cancer treated in, in 2021. He's a former spoke, smoker for 20 years. Uh, he has no complaints of chills or night sweats, occasional fevers, and his weight is stable. On extraoral exam, there were palpable, firm, enlarged cervical lymph nodes bilaterally. On intraoral exam, there was a large yellowish mass on the left floor of the mouth coming from Wharton's duct. So it looked like this. So um, here you can see left floor of mouth. You see this firm, large yellowish mass that looks like it's coming from Wharton's duct. And here's kind of a closer uh, uh, magnified view of it. So our initial clinical diagnosis, actually, actually, uh, in the very beginning, we thought maybe this was a sialolith or some type of soft tissue tumor. Um, but it looked like it was coming from the duct and it sort of had kind of a, a linear shape to it. So we were favoring that. We did a biopsy of the floor of the mouth. This case was actually done by um, my ENT colleague. And, um, you know, he also suspected that let's, maybe this could be a metastatic uh, lymphoma. So why don't we send part of the specimen um, in our PMI fresh for flow cytometry as well? And as far as next steps, we did a neck CT. Um, and then there was supposed to be FNA and lymph node biopsies of the neck masses. So this is what the CT of the neck showed. Um, that there was a mass involving the Leb sublingual space consistent with neoplasm. So if you look at this axial CT slice where my arrow is, I hope you can see it. This is where the mass on the floor of the mouth was. Okay, and then the CT also, also showed extensive left-sided cervical adenopathy suspicious for metastatic disease. So over here, you can appreciate the lymph adenopathy. Okay, and then there was some tonsillar hypertrophy as well. So this is um, an incisional biopsy of the floor of mouth mass. This is a low power photo, Mike. Here you just see a proliferation of round blue cells. And then here's another uh, slightly higher magnification. Again, you see a sheet of round blue cells with a little bit of intervening fibrous stroma. And then this is a high power photo, Mike, really showing you these, um, that these round blue cells are angular uh, lymphocytes. So. We definitely suspected a lymphoma. So then we did some immunohistochemistry to come up with what type of lymphoma that this patient may have. So um, this was a CD20 immunohistochemistry. This just showed that it was a B cell lymphoma. And then this was the diagnostic uh, immunohistochemical stain. BCL1, cyclin D1 immunohistochemistry was positive. And um, you will see in a moment, when I show you this immunohistochemistry table for lymphomas, that um, CD20B uh, lymphocytes and BCL1 positivity strongly point to mantle cell lymphoma. 
which is one of the rare, more aggressive types of lymphoma. Okay, and so it's also CD5 positive, which we found on flow cytometry. So here are some flow cytometry results. Um, and you can see here that the concentration of the, uh, the dots is pointing, first of all, to lymphocyte proliferation. And then over here, that the, um, the concentration points to CD5 positive B cells. So these things are consistent with a diagnosis of mantle cell lymphoma. And this is the hematopathologist's report here. So in terms of diagnosis and treatment, the diagnosis was mantle cell lymphoma in this case. And the treatment, the patient was set up for chem chemotherapy and prescribed ibrutinib. He has started taking the ibrutinib 140 milligram capsules daily. And then this is the end. I just wanted to say, how does ibrutinib work? Okay, and so essentially, it's an oral chemotherapy medication, and it binds to and blocks the action of, um, of BTK enzyme, Bruton's uh, tyrosine kinase. So over here, you can see how um, there's a receptor and antigens binding to it, and then um, it, it's supposed to you know, activate Bruton's tyrosine kinase, but you can see that this um, ibrutinib blocks function of the BTK enzyme which prevents um, uh, you know, it from, there from being any nuclear integration. So that is the end. I really appreciate you staying with me. Thank you so much. I hope you found these cases interesting. So thank you, Dr. Solon. That was indeed very interesting. Now I am going to request everyone to put in their questions. We had a few questions, related questions and comments that we will share now. But any additional ones also will be very nice if you can share. Right. So uh, while you were not there, <laughs> we had a small discussion. So I will just bring it up so that you can uh, weigh in on that once I find it. Sorry. Right. So we had Dr. Nasser and Dr. Nandini trying to keep everybody involved. So Dr. Nasser uh, mentioned that the first two cases can be classified on the MERS and then, uh, all right. And he also suggested Melchior-Rosenthal uh, syndrome. And uh, then we had this from Dr. Nandini, via Maris, and there was no fissured tongue. I'll bring in all this and then you can add in your uh, discussion to that. And uh, Dr. Nasser said there is no fissure tongue for MRS, then isolated colitis granulomatosa, another syndrome associated. Okay. So this was sort of uh, the discussion that was on about the first two cases while we. Well, actually, they were very kindly trying to keep everybody involved. So anything you want to add now to those? Yeah, I, I appreciate I appreciate that, uh, that insightful discussion. Um, I'm, I'm not, you know, the first two cases, oral manifestations of systemic diseases, um, it turns out, um, you know, that both both the, uh, the TB, the tuberculosis um, and the Crohn's are, you know, are granulomatous diseases. So the lip enlargement was really just a, a, like a granulomatous enlargement. So I'm, I, you know, I, I'm not there wasn't I, I don't think there was any other further, um, you know, association with um, Melkerson Rosenthal syndrome. Right. There wasn't any so we, facial paralysis, and I'm not even sure about the fissured tongue. <laughs> correct. So now uh, everyone is just saying very nice cases. That was even while you were not there. Uh, we have a number of uh, people who said that they are very nice cases. Dr. Div Divya and... Dr. Nasser also said very nice presentation. Dr. Prasad and Dr. Nandini. Right. Yeah, so we had a lot of thank yous. <laughs> it, they were very interesting cases. And uh, let me go ahead and give you your certificate. So thank you so much.
uh, for the presentation, for sharing your cases, and uh, they were very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for staying patient and staying with me. And thank you for the opportunity, Dr. Mandana Donahue. I appreciate okay. it. Oh, you are most uh, welcome, Dr. Sonal. It's uh, it, it, it's uh, it's great to have you here, and uh, next week's event, which is in fact going to be another another case presentation. So this is from uh, Dr. Yamuna Devi. Uh, if you remember, during the anniversary event, we had a pad quiz, and she was the winner of that pad quiz. So that is uh, that was the uh, actually part of the prize that uh, the winner got was to present a lecture. Uh, she is uh, also a professor, so it's uh, great to have her. She will be discussing some cases because she is also into actual practice of oral pathology beyond the college. So it is very interesting. And thank you, everybody, for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Sonal, for being with us. And I hope to see everybody uh, soon, next time. Yep, right, Dr. Sonal, in case you want to say bye to everybody. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Uh, thank you so much again for uh, staying with me. I hope you enjoyed those cases. And until next time. Right. We hope to see you back soon. Yeah. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. Great. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. See you all next week. Bye.